going on out there, everybody? And thanks again so much for joining us here on Expanded Perspectives, live from the inferno, folks. It's me, Cam Hill. And as always, joining me today, the man who I just hit with the headline of my news story, and he can't believe it. He wanted to start. I just hit the go button. Cal Phils. How's it going, everybody? Yes, I'm here in Skeleton Studios in a hot and dry <laughs> Texas afternoon. Woo. It's so dry around here. There's fires everywhere. Like I got home last night and I walked outside about midnight and it smelled like somebody was barbecuing. I'm like, yeah. man, somebody grilling a brisket or smoking a brisket. And my wife's like, no, you fool. There's grass fires all over PK. Yeah, PK's burning up. Why is it always that area that seems know. to catch on fire? I don't know. Good burning grass, I guess. I have no idea. But there's been fires everywhere, so uh, my prayers go out to all yeah. the people out there that are losing their stuff and to be with the firefighters that are helping them. But, I mean, just the other day I was driving, and I'm watching a guy smoke a cigarette. And he just throws it out the window. And I'm like, that come man on, should be, man. That man should be whipped. You know, like, do you not notice everything burning up and how dry it is? My wife is furious because all of her plants are dying. Like, you can water them as much as you want. It's not helping. It's just so hot. <laughs> you can't do it. It is, right? Also, shout out to all of y'all in the UK going through this, too, that don't have any way of getting cooled down. Look, man, keep at it. I am sorry. I'm sorry y'all have to deal with this. Do you think it's global changing? I mean, you're asking the wrong guy. Like man caused, or is it just a cycle that the world just changes? You know, like you hear the stories that Antarctica was a jungle at one point, you know, and then the poles changed and... Or is it truly because we keep running everything off fossil fuels? It's probably somewhere in the middle. It probably is. It's got to be part of us. It's got to be part of cycles. It's got to be part of all of that. Part of everything. Yeah, because like we had talked about, if you go and read and pick up the old farmer's almanac and start going through Mm -hmm. that history, you're going to see a lot of trends that we see now. I know. And that's what's so wild. Now, it may not be quite as massive. Or maybe it was just as big back then whenever they started, let's say, in the 30s or 20s or whatever, but there wasn't as many people to report on it. I don't know, but I feel like it's somewhere in the middle. Yeah, because we know there was things like the Dust Bowl and Mm -hmm. stuff that really happened, and that was long ago. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, there are cycles. Yes. But also, like— But we have to be contributing to in some way. But what's the solution? Like, electric cars aren't the solution either because— the stuff in those batteries. Well, and also it, the, the drain it puts on the power grid. They're asking people in Texas not to use electric cars. I, man, I believe it's you. here, isn't it too? Yeah, here in California, there's several states that have that have come out and been like, hey, look, ease up on the charging. If those, you know what it needs to go to? Well, horses and bicycles. If those Belgian businessmen had uh, poisoned Stanley Meyer, <laughs> we might uh, have the cars that run off water. Remember that, that story? Yep, I remember I, that. They may not have been Belgian. I might have been. I might have. Made, I might have made that part up or misremembered that. But there was two men. Remember, there were two guys. Yeah. His brother, uh, I think, wrote a book about it. He came out of the. He invented this car, this apparatus you could put on any car, and it would make it run off water. Mm -hmm. And he met with some businessmen, and he drank some cranberry juice or whatever and came out. uh, 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 His last words was, they poisoned me. And we're not talking about the connection that you can make that where it's supposed to give you better gas mileage on a gas engine. We're talking running off of water. It makes you wonder how many cool cool inventions have been created that people in power— just kind of make them go away, or they buy them, and then they just shelf the patent. I bet a patent. bunch. I bet a bunch. I bet a bunch. But back to the headline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You hit yeah. me with when I was yeah. putting down my, my man bag over there, my Merce. I was pulling out my laptop mm-hmm. and everything, getting ready to record. And you told me if I had seen this article, please, sir. Well, like we have talked about, I knew you're up around South Lake here. All the time. All the time. This headline that I have had, that I, it's one of those ones I'd stored away, right? I'd put it away, and it just never gotten to it. This had come back from last month. I believe it was sometime middle of June. Lon posted this up, and I'm going to have to to message him and be like, bro, I have I had this, and I forgot it's on me, right? Because I he knows I'm always going to talk about this stuff when it comes crazy Texas stuff, folks. Here we go. We met a leprechaun at the South Lake, Texas Costco, folks. Let's dive into this bad boy. I need to speak to this person because I know exactly where the Costco is in South Lake. Well, here we go. This was a couple shopping there. Sent this in the lawn. It says, please note that I am being completely sincere and my wife can vouch for this account encounter. I know that they and their like are considered little more than a joke these days, but I tell you true and I swear it. I met an actual leprechaun and I've been encountering Faye all of my all of my life. 
and I have a theory as to why there was a leprechaun in South Lake. Texas, folks. Okay. My wife and I were looking for a desk at Costco one rainy night, and we found one that we were looking for. I was carrying it out to our car in the rain when we were aggressively confronted by a tiny Irishman. Red hair, green eyes, freckles, and broguish, about three feet in height. His proportions were normal and proportionally to said height from what I could see. He wasn't a little person. He was just really small. He wasn't wearing anything special either, just a t-shirt and jogging pants with sneakers. Not green, but his hair was as red as mine. He called me by my name and he knew my wife's name as well. And as soon as we looked up to address him, he started talking to us about absolutely nothing in particular as if he knew us and hadn't seen us in ages. I was so shocked, I simply answered his questions, listened to him react, again, as if he knew us from way back. How you been doing? What's up? Do y'all still live around here, I said. We lived in my old house, he replied. Ah, good old home sweet home. How's the family, I said. My grandmother's well, and I don't talk to my mother often, he replied. Well, it's fine that you keep an eye on your grand. She's a danger prone, I'm sure. How's the writing going, I said. Writer's block, he replied. As always, eh, keep trying. Any kids, I said. No, we're waiting till we have a place of our own, he replied. A wise decision, young man. He looks my wife in the eye and he says, this one's a keeper. All his responses were just super jovial and friendly, and I barely noticed it, but I had put my umbrella over his head subconsciously, and I was now getting soaked. The entire time, I was wondering if we were the victim of some sort of prank or if he had recognized me from some time before, but me, being an idiot, had forgotten him. Finally, the questions and friendly conversation stopped. He gave us both a mischievous smile complete with eyebrow waggles, and he said, two cents for your two cents. He then handed each of us two new shiny pennies, then he turned and walked into the Costco. We were both so flabbergasted that we didn't speak the entire way home. When we finally got there, I looked at my pennies, then at my wife. Did we just meet a leprechaun? And it kind of fits with all the fey lore that I know. A complete stranger approaches you as if he knows you, waits for you to be rude so he, a fey, can curse you. If you surprise him and are polite, he'll give you a small or large reward. On that note, we put the pennies in a keepsake box and they were gone by morning. Literally, it's like they'd been taken. There was no other money in that box, and nobody else has access to it. That's what made my wife believe the idea that it might have been a leprechaun. As to my theory how or why a leprechaun would be in Texas, well, it's fairly simple. If humans can migrate or go on vacation, then why can't the fae? Most of them pass for human anyway, so it's not that difficult to see one boarding a plane in Europe where there's still a protected species under law, and coming to America to mess with some rude Americans. Tell me what your thoughts are. If he wasn't a leprechaun, I don't know what he was. JT. Wow, that's an incredible story. At first, when you first, when you first started telling it, I was like, no, come on, man. You just met a short guy. What are you talking about? Yeah. But how would he know everything about the guy and his wife? Well, that's where it gets wild. And right? it's writing a book. So I'd love to have a book and an interview with the author if the leprechaun is actually writing his own book. Right. And and but what a good what a good thing be nice to everybody because you might be talking to a fae. But the lesson I learned <laughs> is if the leprechaun bestows you with coinage, you got to spend it in twenty four hours. Well, that's exactly. So you better get to the store or something. You know what my favorite part of this story is is that without realizing he's doing it, he's covering him with that umbrella like he has been fey touched. He's got some sort of fey magic that it washes over you. You don't even realize how kind you're being to him because he's there. Because who in their right mind? You're, it's raining. You get everything done. This stranger, you would just be like, dude, what are you doing? But he, as he's talking, he covers him, and he himself is now standing in the rain. That it's wild. Is a wild, yeah. and cool story. So you know exactly where this is. 
I do. I, I expect recon every time you go by there to see if you see. I'm going to be camping out, and I'm going to be like going around like what is that Channel Five? That guy, and then I'm going to be asking people with a microphone, "Have you seen any leprechauns around here?" All gas, no brakes. Yeah, that guy. Yeah, I'm going to be asking people, "Have you seen any leprechauns?" You know. Maybe someone That's has. Awesome. Uh, speaking of strange sightings, we had a uh, listener call in with a strange sighting they had back in like 1982 in the mountains of Tennessee. Check this out. Hey guys, what's going on? I'm coming to you live out of Hog Holler, Tennessee. I'm going to tell you a story. What if I one not? My uncle, as we was hunting in these great smoky mountains, I guess it was back in 1982. I'd have been about 12 or 13 years old. And we used to fox hunt back then when I was young. And basically when you fox hunt, you don't go out with guns and hunt the fox down and shoot and kill it. It's basically what the old men used to do around here to get away from their wives. They would go out in the woods and and build a fire and turn the dogs loose and just let them run, run the fox. They called it a a fox race or a hound dog race. But they would let these things run the backwoods of the haulers here and talk about whose dog's doing what, whose dog's in the lead. Well, growing up around here, there wasn't much to do these mountains on the weekend so we uh we'd go with me and my cousin and usually we would we would get home about 12 30 so right in there somewhere on saturday nights so uh this particular night that uh, i went out my uncle the, the dog was running pretty good and it was just me and my cousin and my uncle and it started getting late and uh me and my cousin got in the truck seat with the windows down it was a hot summer night and we're both sitting in the truck and the wind is down and his dogs are really running and barking they're they're chasing a fox way off in the woods and so he walks off to to try to hear him a little better to get further out out on the ridge where he can really hear his dogs running because he would pay four or five hundred dollars for a dog and he had six or seven of them so uh he would get out there and uh, and get away from us. Well, me and my cousin, we had sat in the truck. We were tired, and we had nodded off to sleep. And uh, I don't really know how long we was asleep. It must have been a pretty good while because the time had passed. And I felt the truck vibrate as my head was leaned up uh, where the window would have been but it was actually against the back part of the window there and uh i felt it vibrate a little bit well i woke up immediately because i I thought the truck was rolling down the hill i thought i had knocked the emergency brake off and knocked it out of gear and thought we were rolling down the hill so my eyes come wide open when that happened when i felt this vibration i didn't hear no sound and uh I looked over, and there in the sky, without any sound at all, was the biggest orange orb, biggest orange light that I had ever seen. It was the size of a setting sun when the sun sets, but you can still fully see the sun, and it was that color orange, except now it was 2.30 in the morning. And I only caught a glimpse of it for maybe three to four seconds. And as I did that, it sort of imploded at the same time as it went down behind the mountains. <clears throat> and it had curved lines in behind it, like half moons following it down, like three to four. And this just, just shocked me. I didn't know what, I, what it was. I have drawled this thing a thousand times in my life hundred thousands of times on pieces of paper i catch myself today sitting there when i'm doodling and i draw this thing out um i don't know what it was i've often wondered and i've often thought and today i I think what i saw was a portal open up in the sky 
But I expected the next day when I woke up, I expected this to be on the news, to be on the world news. I, I, I thought the whole world had to see this thing. Even though it didn't light up the ground, it was so huge in the sky. Well, a few minutes later, here comes my uncle out of the woods in a pretty big hurry. So I'm sure that he had saw this. So I asked him, I said, what was that? Well, he played dumb or he really didn't see it one. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. I, what was what? And I knew right then I was wasting my time with him because he, he was a, he was a non-believer in anything or he let on like he was. So from that point on, I found out the next day, nobody had saw this thing, nobody in the world. And I couldn't explain what I saw. There was no ship. There was nothing but this huge, huge orange light. And that has stayed with me. I'm 53 years old now. I live here in the Great Smoky Mountains, Tennessee. I live right outside Pigeon Forge. And uh, that has haunted me and stayed with me since the day that that happened. But I've actually, and I'm, and I'm not trying to self-promote or anything, but I've actually, if you want to see a picture of it, I, I've got a YouTube channel, and, and it's under South Force 10. And in one of my episodes, you can tell by the thumbnail, I've drawn it out. You can see this huge circular thing. I've drawn it out a couple of times on a piece of paper. And the only other place that I had ever seen anything remotely like this, and I tell this story on there, is I remember back in the 80s, uh, late 80s, I was watching an episode of Unsolved Mysteries, and they were talking and maybe flipping through a book or looking through little pictures, and right there was a picture, it looked like the sun with lines going, these lines, except they wasn't curved, they were going through the sun. Well, years later, I found out that was the uh, Nuremberg experience that happened back years ago, if y'all will look that up. But that's the only thing I've ever seen, and I think that's what they saw back then, uh, this battle in the sky back in those days, I don't know, 1500s or what it was. But anyway, guys, I'll, uh, I'll get off from here, man. I've got so many stories. I'd love to talk to y'all. Y'all are my very favorite podcast, YouTube channel. Can't wait for you to put a new one on every week. I look very, very forward to it. And... Uh, that's really all I've got for you guys. Uh, I'd ask if you click through some of my pictures on the community channel. There's uh, there's one where there's a transparent figure standing right in front of me with horns on its head. Kind of scary looking. But like I say, I'm not trying to self-promote. You, you can cut all this part out if you want to. But guys, I really appreciate everything you do. Bye. And there we go. Very cool. Uh, was he abducted by aliens or was it a portal in the sky? Uh, Going very, up to the portal in the sky. Right, very no. cool story. Thank you so much for sending that in. If you have a story you'd like to share with us and the other listeners and you'd like to tell it and have it replayed on the air, you just got to call the hotline folks, 888-393-2783. Uh, well, let's get into your segment, Cam. What are you going to be talking about? Well, we're going to be diving into more Fey encounters. Buttered the bread a little bit, now we're going to toast it. On the other side of this break, I'm going to be bringing up not quite maybe leprechaun encounters, but definitely Fey. Digging in a little bit more on that and making us take a little bit closer to look at what's around us, folks. Let's take a quick break. When we get back, we'll dive into it. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. y'all it's fey time <laughs> this is absolutely probably one of my if not my most favorite stories is because i love the idea like we've talked about of the gnomes and the fey and the brownies and all of these i love it we get a lot of encounters that i personally would label as fey encounters because it feels like fey is a broad statement right that's a broad brushing in all encompassing thing. It's almost like if we can't put it, and I don't know why we're like this, you know, all of us are like this. We like to compartmentalize, right? We want to know this is Bigfoot, this is UFO. But with Faye, Faye seems to cover so many things. 
Uh, like it, it, it's like the largest. It's like saying paranormal. When you say fae, there are so many encounters that have somewhat resemblance, but are mainly all different. But it all is fae related or fae esque. And I'm going to start you off with one like this. It says, I was watching a documentary one time where Faye were mentioned, and it made me think of a very strange experience I had 12 years or so when I was living in Northwest Florida. Now, this isn't a story that I like to share a lot because it does sound completely insane, and that if someone was to tell me, I would say there's no way, right? This didn't happen. But I've got to share this. I want to know more about the Faye. So it was a late afternoon or I'm sorry, early afternoon, late morning, during the summer, and I was standing on my porch balcony, which is about seven foot off the ground. I was out there just watering my plants. I had some rosemary, some catnip, and so on. Well, when I see what I thought was a large wasp flying towards me from a wooded area next to my house, and now this thing is moving, it's flying really fast. Now, this whole encounter happened pretty quick, But the closer it got, well, it started to look more like a human. Now, what I first thought were a wasp's antenna started to look more like small human legs and arms. And it's gold. Now, it's not yellow and it's not brown. This thing is gold. I also had the impression that it was fleeing from something. Now, I can't really describe its face other than it had large eyes because it was looking behind its back most of the time. And again, this all happened very fast. And when I say large, I mean unnaturally large. Almost too big for its face. Now, oddly enough, I can't remember their color. Then this thing flies into my cheek, and it kind of bounces off, and it keeps flying. I look back again, or it looked back again, at me for a split second, and then passed me again as if it were being chased by something where it was trying to get away. Then it looked forward and flew to the next closest tree that was maybe four foot away. And now this thing literally disappeared into the tree. Now, like I said, it was gold. So I would have seen it if it were crawling around on the bark, but it was like this thing melted into the tree and then it was gone. I was I was left just kind of standing there like, what did I just see? And I had this overwhelming feeling like I wasn't supposed to see that. There was something strange about this house and property anyway. Even my boyfriend, who's a pretty big skeptic, remembers that house as being a very odd place. But like I said before, if anything about this encounter hits close to home, let's share this. So folks, there we go. Is this a sprite? A fairy? I never even thought in a million years about there being fae that might look like a wasp. Right? Nobody thinks of that. What? Imagine if there are fae that resemble insects. Because we know there are insects that resemble nature. Right? That's their natural camouflage. Stick bugs. You've got moths. You've got butterflies. There's all of these that have these different camo patterns, different shapes, all of these things that make them blend in well to nature. It's kind of arrogant not to believe that the Fae would have easily be able to adapt something like that. And in today's modern era, what better way to, to hide? Right? If you're not hiding as a trash bag, you're hiding as a wasp. That is a fascinating story. So again, we don't know what's out there, but the idea of a small golden fairy with large eyes, which that's pretty wild, right? Human looking face, or at least human arms and legs, they believe. Very, very odd sighting. Here's another one that says, I was in my 20s and dating a guy that loved camping and hiking just like I did. Now we took a trip to visit some of his friends in Kentucky. Now this couple lived in the middle of, of the Daniel Boone National Forest on about 150 acres. And the road up to their house was graded, but it was a one-lane drive that just made its way winding through the deep woods back to their home. Now, neighbors were few and far between, and when we got to the house, I felt like I had reached some sort of haven. They lived in a cleared part of the land, 
The fella had built a log cabin there for living and then had built their log cabin. And they were entirely off grid. No electricity, just a generator for emergencies, a wood stove, and water piped in from a crystal clear creek that flowed from a cave on that property. Interesting enough, this cave was filled with native petroglyphs. Now, this entire area had a feeling about it, a very magical feeling. The cabin was surrounded by the woman's gardens, and they grew all of their own fruits and vegetables, and flowers were everywhere. The yard was generous, and cleared areas were filled with lush grass. The edge of the, the lawn, or the yard, met the, up to the tree line, and the creek was right there, just on the other side of the trees. It was truly a beautiful area. We were stretching from a long drive, and the woman was showing me her gardens. The bed closest to the edge of the lawn area and to the tree line had all kinds of things planted. I listened to her speak about everything she grew and canned and absorbed by her enthusiasm and sweet Kentucky accent. When out of the corner of my eye, I saw a huge insect hovering around my shoulder height. Now, I tried to ignore it, but it persisted, darting away, then coming back to hover. Now, when I finally turned to look at the bug... I remember gasping out loud. It was a tiny being hovering right near me. It had a short dark hair and his clothes looked like leaves. They were that green color. His wings were flapping incredibly fast like a hummingbird's. As I stood there with my mouth open in shock, he put his hands up to his ears, closed his eyes and blew a raspberry at me then darted off. For those of you that are the uninitiated, you know, I'm thinking of raspberries. Just being ornery, right? I thought I was seeing things, completely sober when this happened. I turned to look at my host. She saw my face and asked, did you see one of our fairies? We'll be able to see the lights tonight. Sure enough, as we sat on the porch that evening, the far lawn had these lights that would show up in the grass, rise into the air, and then come back down to the grass. Not fireflies. These were unlike anything I'd seen. My boyfriend and I camped in a tent outside, and when I woke early the next morning, I took a barefoot stroll around, looking at all the flowers and even wading in the creek. In my wanderings, I found a perfectly formed fairy circle in the grass. I've seen a lot of weird stuff in my life, but that was the most magical experience I'd ever had. I'm convinced that the couple put so much respect and love into their land that it invited that kind of magical presence. And I believe that fairies are interdimensional, which is why we rarely see them and never find any remains of them. That's a great point. Thanks so much for that one. I do believe that. All right. I'm hoping y'all do too. If, that if you put the love out there, you put that into the land, you build this sanctuary area of where you're happy. They're unplugged, right? There's no Wi-Fi signals. There's no routers. There's no electricity. We know all these things can bother bees and other insects. Even ourselves, everything is affected by what flies through the air that we can't see. It only makes sense that if you built a refuge like that and they're fey in these areas, more than likely, they're going to show up. Here's another one that keys off of that. It said, I had an experience while camping near a river one time. Same thing with the fireflies. They were lit up, but they looked like giant fireflies. And as they got closer, I was just in awe. They were large. And then about that time, my memory starts to fade. When this happened, my boyfriend and I were skinny dipping. And the next thing we knew, we woke up hours later in our camper, still naked. Now, he's my ex, but always believed in Faye. But I would just always write it off. But this time, I'm not sure. This time, I'm not sure if it was Faye or if it was a UFO abduction. And they implanted this memory because of the amnesia we both have at this point and the missing time. Well, that's a nice little little segue into that, right? Would this be considered, this is what we had talked about, the umbrella. They saw f- fireflies themselves. 
They saw large fireflies, and as they grew closer, they noticed something about them. May have been Faye-esque, and then their memory fades. Both of them. Just gone. And then you wake up hours later in your camper. Where did they go? Right? What happened? So we're assuming it has to be in the evening, or at least close to evening, when you see the fireflies. Maybe they were alien. Maybe they were Faye. Maybe they took you somewhere. Maybe you got... A little confused, didn't know it, and they gave you something, and maybe you ate or drank from the fay, which we know you're not supposed to do. I don't know, but B, thanks for sending that. That is crazy. Here's another one. This one goes, I was a teenager standing outside in my backyard of my childhood home, and at the time, there were a lot of plants growing. This is a really big backyard, and this particular area right in front of me on the ground was covered in rolling ivy. When out of the corner of my eye, I see something. And I pick it out because it's tiny, but because of its color, it's flesh-toned, like a light beige, which didn't match any of the plants or the soil at all. So it grabs my attention and I quickly look over. I see a small humanoid in form anyway, with translucent wings that look like dragonfly wings, like a large one. There's black insect-looking eyes larger than their head and pointed ears. When I noticed them, they hid behind the ivy and was gone. And from then on, I now believe wholeheartedly in the fae. So again, a quick view, a quick look, And they've seen what looked like a beige or flesh-colored wasp, right? Black insect-looking eyes, large head, pointed ears, dragonfly wings. How easy would it be for that to fly by moving through the woods and you never see it, right? Are you just easily, oh, bugs, oh, grasshoppers, ah, you know, anything. It would be easy to write these off. Now, instantly, I start thinking about, well, how come nobody's ever hit them on their windshield like bugs, right? But then I catch myself. Well, if they're fey, they're not dummies. They're not just going through the motions. If you're going to cross over a road or any boundary like that, I'm sure they're going to fly high enough to go right over the top, tree line height, right? But then I wonder, too, about birds or, again, about praying mantis. Is that something the Fae has to worry about? While they're flying around or landing or doing something, could a mantis grab them? Are birds of prey or bats or anything out there after? Is that a battle that the Fae fight? I mean, I I can't see how it wouldn't be. Here's another one that P sends in. It says, I had an encounter on a hot summer day. I was sitting in this big field waiting for my friends to come back from a walk down the hill to a creek. When out of nowhere comes this little humanoid figure that's inside a ball of dandelion fluff. I sat there and watched this little thing float right past me. The crazy part is, although its face was a blur of movement, I swear it was smiling. It was also making this really happy wee sound as it spun about inside the dandelion fluff. I've never told anyone this story until now. Thanks. Another one. It's quick. It's simple. It happened. It would be something easily brushed off, easily ignored. You're working in your yard, even going for a walk, some dandelion stuff, but you don't pay any attention to that, which might be the reason the Fae use it. So much easier, right? It's so simple. But... Again, with this, and it seems to be natural, right? They're not riding around in a a plastic bottle or a bag. No, they're flying around in dandelion fuzz. Which, again, if we were fae, we were that size, wouldn't the world be a lot more fun if you could fly around in dandelion stuff? You couldn't get hurt. That fae live a long time. You're not really getting hurt. You get to have all kinds of fun, and they seem to be having a great time. Here's another one here that says, I had an encounter about four years ago, I'd say. I live in a very rural area, and my closest neighbor is around a quarter of a mile from me. I was taking my dog outside to use the bathroom, and I usually stand on the porch and watch him just to make sure he doesn't take off exploring. Now, this was summer, and it was dark out. It was probably 10 or a little bit later, 
and a huge glowing thing flew right by my face. Now, when it happened again, it was like everything was in slow motion. And this time I saw its little body and face and it was female. And if you've ever seen the film Moulin Rouge with Nicole Kidman, it reminded me of the green fairy from the movie. I thought maybe I was going crazy. I don't know what I saw. I've always heard the only thing that or the only let you see them when they want to be seen. Now, my grandmother has taught me to leave milk and cake out for them since I was young. So I figure maybe that's their way of saying thanks. It was a special moment I'll always remember. And when I have children, I'll teach them to do the same for the Fae and let them know that we mean them no harm and that this was their land also and first. So, again, folks, another insect. This one, a little glowing insect by itself, shot by slow-mo the second pass. And it is, it's like when they choose to let you see them. And what's funny is, knowing the Fae, we don't know if that choice to let you see them is because they're being kind, right? Or is it doing because they know it's going to mess with you? And again, we know they're a little mischievous. So it might be a little bit of both. They might be like, what's the harm? They look fine. Hey, how you doing? Man, that's going to mess with their head, right? Like that, again, sounds like it's fun to be a fae. Here's another one from Ty that says, I'm not sure if this is a good place to drop this experience, but... I'm going to let it go. It's an old memory that I need to talk about. In 1999, I was seven, and I was out playing in the woods with my friend Charlotte. Now we were standing at the end of a big log in the woods when I noticed movement out of the corner of my eye. I tried focusing on it to catch a detailed look, and I see similar movement often when we're in the woods, and it always disappears or scatters like this before I can turn. Now, my heart skipped a beat when I could make out a group of little people looking up at me as well. I was frozen in the pose I was playing in. After a few seconds, I realized Charlotte had stopped narrating out the play and was frozen in place as well, staring at me, but focusing on them. Now, I'm pretty sure they were dressed because it didn't look like they were all naked. I could tell that they knew we were aware of them, and they dispersed as Charlotte moved her eyes. Now, we didn't talk about any of this until we were in her house. Now, we weren't afraid. We were just, I guess, too confused to talk on our walk home. We wrote out what we saw both before talking about it, which that sounds pretty smart, right, for a kid, and to see if we had seen the same thing. And unfortunately, both of our descriptions were so vague but clothed less than a foot tall, for sure. One thing we were positive of was to mind our business and to not go searching, which is what our instinct would have usually been, right? We thought we found a colony of little people in the woods, but the fact that our reaction was to quietly leave and not even talk about it until behind closed doors and still not talk out loud about it, but write it, I don't remember being too frightened. In fact, we kind of just accepted this whole thing and moved on with a new taste of what the world or the universe was capable of. Now, I watched The Indian in the Cupboard later on in life, which reminded me of these little people, but I no longer saw them by then. Charlotte and I would talk about seeing things out of the corner of our eye, but we could never figure out what it was. And although Charlotte was different, her name and her dad were Hugh, or her, I guess it's supposed to be her mom, but it says here her and her dad were huge hippies, and her imagination was so wildly magnificent that it made my mind radiate. I always thought that maybe her narration of our play was so powerful and energetic that we could manifest and see these same little things. The little people were never playing any parts in either of our imaginations. In fact, we were both confirmed what each other had seen, we were kind of in awe that we had never even thought about little people in this whole universe until that moment. So right there, one encounter changes this these two people forever. 
And again, they have an encounter with little people in the woods. Now, I do like the fact that they're a foot tall, 12 inch, dressed, looking up at them like, we're not supposed to be seen, right? Now, we've covered them in the past where people had reported seeing them gathering water. Remember, we had talked about some that were like six inches tall, gathering water. I got the buddy of mine that had seen them out at his deer lease. There's a lot of these tales, too, about small Native Americans. Now, I like this one. Erica Sin says, I have a friend who is pagan, and anytime I'm losing anything, especially a shiny object, she told me to put out a thimble of sweet alcohol. Well, I had tequila rose, sweet cream tequila, so I just used that. And the item would be found the next day. So supposedly, you can bribe them to either help you or give back the item. I'm not sure how much of this is true to the belief system, or if it was just her pagan interpretation. I have no idea. But it has seemed to work for us whenever we lose anything important and shiny, like earrings or my wedding band. Now that, too, is another great story. I I love the idea, right, of gifting things to the Fae. Now you got to be careful. You got to be real careful. You don't want to gift them too much, then they show up, and all hell breaks loose, you know, with the Fae. But it is neat that you're like, hey, now, of course, people might think he was a little wild, but that might be a good thing. So, folks, if you're missing anything shiny and you just have an idea, get you a thimble, get you a tiny little cup, put your little alcohol in it, set it out somewhere by one of your plants just to see what happens, right? Let's find out. Maybe the fail, you might look around, maybe it comes right back. Who knows? All right. Here we go with another one that I think you're going to like here. This is SB says, when I was a child, I used to play with fairies at the bottom of the garden. I have vivid memories of these colorful creatures, and even my mother used to hear me chatting away with my fairy friends. Until one day, the man down the street, cleaning some fence line, chopped down the trees and bushes where I played, and I never saw the fairy or the fae again. Now we've discussed this too. The Fae will build their homes. What is it? Man, I'm going blank now. Was it Norway? That'll move them around for possible ferry areas, move their their uh, the roads, things that work around. Not to be trifled with. I would like to know, SB would, would find out, or if could even find out, if anything happened to that fella, right? Like the person, the, the man that came and chopped those trees down. Like, I wonder what happened to him. So here's another one. Here's another one. FG says, back in the day when I was drinking myself to death, sort of drunk, I used to sit outside my house at night and drink and smoke. Here we are with the smoking again, too, folks. Now, this is a good point. And, you know, much props to to FG here. He says, I want to make it clear that I was not sober and hadn't been in a few years at this point. So you can take this story with a grain of salt. Anyway, one night I was sitting outside just doing my thing and I saw a point of light spark up right off to my left near the garage inside the lilac bush. It wasn't light, really. It was like backlight, only blacker, if that makes any sense. Like ultra, ultra violet. It was only there for a few seconds, and then it was gone. I had the impression of fairy, which is super strange, as I don't really think anything at that time in my life would have made me think fairy. I wasn't into any of this stuff, a magic or a cult or any of this. I honestly can't tell you if it was a hallucination or if I actually saw something, but I was never much of a hallucinator before this or after this. So, I do like this fact. If G prefaces it, look, I was heavily drinking and had been for quite some time. I think we've all been there where we've all drank more than we should. Maybe not, you know, the whole deal, all been there. But I can personally raise my hand to say I have never, never have I ever, right, seen an ultra, ultra violet flash inside a lilac bush. I'm thinking, is this when they come out? Is that them crossing into their interdimension? Is that what it looks like when they crack the door? Is this the light coming through, the little quick flash? Maybe it is. So maybe that lilac bush was much like the bush before. This is where they could hang out. They come and go because, 
you know, FG's a little a little bit inebriated. They don't have any point to talk to. It's, it's easy to fly out around someone who's a drunk, right? Easy to fly out around someone who's under the influence of anything heavy because you can't trust yourself. So it works in the same. But it easily could have been opening the door to the fey realm and they just let a little bit of a light out. So here is another one that says, I'm not sure what this experience is, but it did occur in this otherworldly way, and I don't really know how to talk about it. So here it is. It's going to be a little jumbled. I've never written this down before. And as I'm doing this, I'm trying to get the details right, but I'm shaking. I want to share this story to see if anyone has had a similar experience. I haven't really told any friends about this, and I'm worried that they will think I'm losing my mind. So I grew up in a sort of hectic household. My mother is wonderful, but my father was incredibly abusive. Now, I have a sister who is two years older than me, and for most of our childhood, we would have the same reoccurring dreams that involved us going to this fairy world. In my 20s now, and honestly don't remember a lot of the details, and looking back, it seems totally insane that we would be having the same dreams, but at the same time... We didn't think anything of it. I do vividly remember how we would spend our days talking about all the things we did with the fairies the night before and all the things that we would do when the fairies came to pick us up that night and take us to their world. This went on for a few years. Sometimes months would go by without any fairies. Then we would have the same dream, if you will, again, where they picked us up and brought us to their world. Now, I know this sounds completely unbelievable, and honestly, I didn't think about it for years. I had just chalked it up to my childhood imagination, forgotten all about it, and moved on with life. Then I met my beautiful friend, who I'll refer to as T. T is this extremely ethereal, non-binary person who's incredibly stunning and just has the warmest energy ever. They consider themselves clairvoyant, and have given extremely accurate readings to some of our mutual friends. I've never been a skeptic, really, but I also have always taken these sorts of things with a grain of salt. Oh, that's a skeptic. So T and I started hanging out a lot, but never really talked about anything paranormal. We actually spent more time talking about our crushes and making jokes about reality TV, and so I definitely never told them anything about the fairies. And at the point that this happened, I had never really told anyone. And my sister and I hadn't talked about it since we were kids. So, which is why I was so surprised when one night we're hanging out, and they literally said out of nowhere, so tell me about the fairies. I nearly fainted. I asked what they were talking about. They said, the ones who visited you and your sister, they're still watching you, you know. And I immediately burst into tears and told them everything. Then I called my sister and started freaking out too. She said she remembered everything about the fairies and she couldn't believe it. I even called my mom and she said she remembered us talking about the fairies and she always thought it was strange that we would have the exact same dreams. Now, honestly, I know this sounds insane, but I swear on my life, this is all true. I never thought fairies were real. Not at all. But this has changed everything and has me questioning a lot. But I really don't know how to talk to anyone about it without them thinking I've lost my mind. It just seems too coincidental that my sister and I would have this shared experience and then someone else would bring it up years later. I'm so confused. Has anyone had any similar fey experiences or encounters? Please share. Now, what do y'all think about that? Isn't that wild? This person has had the exact same dream as their sister, the exact same way, and that they would talk about it the next day. Yo, y'all went to the same place. That's not a dream. That doesn't happen that way, right? Y'all got gathered up and taken to another place. Folks, I hope you enjoyed it. I've got one more here I want to leave you with from Fred. says, when I was younger, my brother and I shared a room and would constantly see figures run around and hide under our bed. One time, even pulling my blanket off the bed. And one night, and I know this is hard to believe because I don't really understand it, but I think 
I accidentally astral projected and started walking around my house and saw these little figures running all around my house. It didn't scare me at first, but then they tried to keep me from getting back to my body. They blocked the stairs. They threw me down the stairs when I got close. I can still hear their laugh to this day. They had pointy ears and short black hair. And I think, I'm 26 now, that they have been following me from house to house. Recently, I haven't been able to find wrist straps that I use for the gym, even though I've looked in every room in the house. I'm assuming they have just taken them. And just the other night, I thought I heard tiny pattering footsteps and that laughter. Now, so far, they've been harmless, but they are extremely annoying. So I don't know if this person astral projected, right? Fred, I have no idea. Or if you slipped into the Fey realm, they brought you in there and now they're teasing you. And it's not like Fey. This almost sounds like brownies, right? Like they are really giving him a hard time, really just taking him to the cleaners, messing with him. So again, some seem to be fancy and, and nice and loving and others seem to be a bit mischievous. And then you have true nature Fey, right? I, Again, it's an all-encompassing brush. I hope you enjoyed it. I love the Faye stories. If you have any Faye stories, even if you have some that you don't think are Faye, but they fall under this realm, please send them in. I want to read them. I want to collect them. We have a stack, and we want to keep adding. Folks, I hope you enjoyed it. Let's take a quick break. When we get back, I'll pick Big Fizzy's brain about the Faye. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. There's a few crazy fae stories. Folks, keep an eye out for insects, okay? They might be fae. It does make you wonder. And now, after hearing all of this, right, with the glowing fae, the possible light in the lilac bush, uh, the green orbs that looked like fae, I have a question for you, sir. Sure. Now, after all of these years and all of this stuff, knowing the one odd thing that you've seen, which is where we were just the other day. Could it have been Faye? It's possible. You never know. You know, could it have been maybe a group it or something? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it could. It might have been, I don't know, just something that might have been Faye, paranormal. Who the heck knows? But there that is. I also saw something very interesting. I need to find it again real quick about a uh, a documentary or a segment or whatnot that I believe it's on Netflix about the guys from Top Gear. Uh -huh. And in one of the episodes, without even, even knowing they were doing it when they were filming it, all of this stuff, it was picked up later. They're at a site, I believe, of a crash. Okay? Okay. And they're talking about it, and you actually see either the Glimmer Man or some specter in the background move from behind a tree, kind of walk out, and then all of a sudden just kind of float or vanish into the background as it's moving its way towards the other trees. Really? Yeah, it's pretty wild. Man, I don't know about that. I'll, I'll find it and have to yeah. have them drop it in the show notes. But check, yeah, you have to check that stuff out. I have to check out. it out. I did see on Netflix there was a new series about D.B. Cooper. Uh, <laughs> it's like a four-part series. Very cool. If I'm you're halfway that kind through of thing. it right now. Very interesting, right? Yes. Yeah. I'm, I, dude, I love the idea of D.B. Cooper. And I, I saw our buddy Darren on there that we had on, the guy from uh -huh. the Cooper Vortex. Yep. He's actually on the program, so that's pretty cool. I'm glad he's doing well. Uh, that's still – it's one of the coolest stories because it's that romantic idea, right? Yeah. Like this guy got away with it. Yeah. The FBI, no one knows who he was. Nobody knows if he survived. But he, he pulled it off. He's the only guy to pull it off. Ever. Yeah. I mean, so it's it makes him, awesome. Makes him like a James Bond – type character well and you think too of the time of uh, uh, of when it happened you know in the <clears> 70s <throat> early 70s 71 like yep. that's a wild time to start with anyway like it, it really was it's people right now you have no idea what it was like it was wilder back then literally zero uh security i even remember as being a kid the first time i flew i think the only security was like an old school metal detector no it wasn't even that i don't think 
I think it was one of those deals that you had. To, yeah, there may have been a metal detector there by then, but it wasn't anything like it is now. Literally, you could just walk in and buy a ticket. Pay for a ticket. Yeah, and be done. Like you're getting cash. on a bus. You could yeah. do it like, you know, $54 cash. Yeah. yeah. Wasn't There's nothing. no record, no nope. background checks, no nothing. Very different time. If you're interested in D.B. Cooper, I suggest you go over to Netflix and watch that. Or you should listen to our interview. It's called The Cooper Vortex. You can find it in our back catalog. Very cool. Um, before we get out of here, on the last show, uh, I had mentioned when we were talking about the, some recent sightings and discoveries about megalodons and things like that, I had mentioned a caller that way back in the day, like in July of 2014, that called into the show, uh, a guy named Craig. And he told the story about his Megalodon sighting that he had and of the ghost ship sighting he also had. So I went back and I found that, and I'm going to play it for you now. Check this out. All right, everybody. We got a quick treat this evening. Uh, one of the listeners of the show and good friend of ours, Mr. Craig here, called in and left us a really interesting story. And it blew me and Kyle away. So we just had to contact him and had him tell it again so we can ask a few questions. Craig, if you don't mind, tell us a story about this giant shark that you saw okay uh, i absolutely will uh try going to a little bit uh more detail i was a uh, uh united states navy signalman uh aboard the uss detroit uh aoe4 it's a sacramento class oiler ship uh we supplied the uh battle group and the carrier with uh fuel ammo supplies and stuff like that <clears throat> um on August 7th, we were scheduled to make a uh, Medgar's deployment, and then that uh, August, or that was of 1990, right? And then, um, uh, was it uh, August 2nd, Saddam Hussein had actually invaded Iraq. So <clears throat> we were we were actually heading over, um, after he invaded, we were actually headed over across the Atlantic, still planning to do our Medgar's and found out that, hey, we're going to war. Um <clears throat> So on the way, we were joined by uh, quite a few other ships and um, uh, with our battle group. And about five days into the Atlantic, so it takes about 10 days to cross. And I'm, I, that's a right around the middle. Um, we do a, what we call an underway replenishment. So we would actually, we're just like floating gas stations. So we just take the aircraft carrier down one side. In fact, uh, people online, you can go look at it up online. In fact, you can go look up USS Detroit. Uh, just look up images, and you'll see uh, my ship actually doing that. Um, nice. <clears throat> and so we take uh, take the aircraft carrier down the port side, and we take uh, other ships down the uh, starboard side. In fact, that day, I think we were actually take we had carrier on the port side, another ship on the starboard side, and uh, we had the carrier actually was doing a, uh, an assisted replenishment on the other side of it. So we actually had four ships. We were very restricted maneuverability when we're doing this. Now, as we pretty much just run a straight line, go about 14 to 16 knots. <clears throat> so um, it'd been a pretty busy day that day, and I was a uh, watch section leader, and I had my guys up, and it was getting time for chow. So I just I just told them, I said, hey, I've got it. We've got no messages going out, and um, <clears throat> so I sent them down the chow, and uh, so I'm sitting there in the uh, signal shack, uh, making logs, writing uh, in the logbook. And um, next thing I know, I get the combat information center, uh, calls me on the growler and the sound pad phone. I pick it up, answer, and they say, hey, one of the lookouts is uh, reporting something odd at about uh, five miles out. And I said, well, okay, all right, I'll, I'll come out and look at it. And um, so by the time I finished up the log, I got out there. And uh, as soon as I walked out, I saw uh, it was probably – by that time, it was probably about four, four and a half miles. And uh, I saw a white shape out there uh, in, the, in the ocean. And I'm thinking, huh, that looks looks like a small boat, like a small sailing vessel. You know, and I'm thinking, out here in the Atlantic, they, they really got to be in trouble. Right, <laughs> right. Right, that's yeah. not, right, that's not good. And so, you know, I walk over to look at it. I said, you know, hey, is that what you're, is what you're seeing? He goes, yeah. And so I have to... Which is our just that we have these big binoculars. I don't even remember what power they're all power ultimate, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, infinite forever. And uh, yeah, I know, right? And, and so I'm looking at this thing, and you know, I'm, I'm, one of my duties as a signalman is to make out intelligence reports. Um, we used to have all these publications for all, for all these ships and stuff. Uh, we had to really look for detail. Um, 
stuff like that. Our main job was communications, flags, semaphore, uh, Morse code via flashing light, stuff like that. But we were also really kind of the eyes of the ship. And um, so I've been used on uh, Coast Guard uh, special missions. Uh, I, was, I was really very good at identifying things. See, I once caught a drug plane at night. He was, and he was uh, about 30 miles out flying about 20 feet above the water and all i all i just identified him just as just because he just had a light one light wow he wow. didn't even have running lights right and they actually yeah, coast guard actually caught it so huh. uh highly trained <laughs> to, to, sounds to like it yeah right so that's just a little bit of the, of the background so there i am on the big eyes and i'm looking i'm like eh, it's about uh seas are fairly calm six to seven feet out in the middle of the ocean really that's that's pretty calm <laughs> so, and it's nothing for a small boat if you're seeing seas like that to, to kind of dip in and out. You, it's kind of a now you see it, now you don't. And um, so I'm looking, that's kind of how it's behaving, but it's not. You would expect that a boat that's maybe not under power, and I didn't see a sail, to to kind of flounder, right? Not pointing in a general direction, just kind of. And uh, But it was, looked like it was heading right towards us. So I watched it. And I watched it, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, I can't, I can't call an emergency because then we'd have to break four, you know, three ships away. Uh, you know, that's, <laughs> that's a lot riding on my opinion. So yeah. I thought, oh, here, I can just, just wait. And um, I couldn't believe my eyes at about three miles out. I got a pretty good picture. Three and a half miles. I'm looking at this thing. I'm thinking, I start seeing a, like a, like a dark shape, like a hole in the middle of the, what would be the bow, or what, I, what looks to be the bow. At three miles, mm. I realize this is a shark. Whoa. And he is leaping out of the water, just like his front half. Boom. He's not disappearing behind the waves. He's leaping out of the water with his mouth gaping open. I have never seen him like this before or since. Um, so, so I call, I tell the lookout, I call back down to the Inf combat information center. I say, Hey, it's, uh, we just, we just have a really big shark. And they're like, what? I said, I said, we have a really big shark. It's a, well, all right. so, so a couple of those guys came up and we're going to see this. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it starts to, to attract a crowd. And, um, so I watched this thing for a while and I thought, well, you know what? I need to go get my camera. So I go get my camera and I kind of zoom out and I take a couple pictures. And um, now at this time, I didn't know anything about great white sharks. In fact, all my time in the Navy, uh, I spent six years in the Navy. I never saw, this is the only shark, uh, great white, that I've ever seen or anything like it, if that makes sense. Sounds like you got your quota in in one. Yeah. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I mean, you saw blue sharks, you saw a lot of different other kinds of sharks, but I didn't saw hammerheads. But, you know, so, you know, I'm looking at this thing, I got my camera, and uh, other people are now looking through the big eyes, and um, I realize he's not shying away. He's heading straight for us hmm. at about a mile out without the aided... Uh, binoculars out there without our big eyes as we call them mm -hmm. i could see him and see that it was a shark and see that his mouth was open mm. he still leaped out of the water now when you have the two ships together especially at us and an aircraft carrier the, we have the two wakes coming between the ships just kind of churning and creating a lot of uh uh waves and stuff a lot of turbulence water turbulence between the two ships Usually, I don't even see um, porpoises or dolphins go between that. Plus, we've got both props from the ship. I figure an aircraft carrier has four, and we have two big ones. And that creates a lot of suction, and pretty much anything that gets in between there just gets sucked in and chopped up for bait. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so I'm watching this thing, and it seemed like about a half a mile, maybe not quite even that, maybe maybe a third of a mile, he, uh, he stops jumping. And I can see him, and he keeps—he can see him in the water, and he can—he's just 
just moving like tortoise. Is he still like right and, at the surface? Yeah. Yeah, he stayed right on the surface. Like old school jaws, like the fins sticking yeah, yeah. out and everything. Exactly. Oh, oh man. man. I'm already I getting mean, sweaty palmed, man. I hate that <laughs> stuff. <laughs> so, yeah, just uh, for the people listening, you know, I know I'm describing a like, like, you know, a mile this, a mile that, five miles out. That's nothing at a, at, 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 uh, out in the ocean. I mean, we, you know, I'm 75 feet up in the air on top of my ship, on my ship, on my signal bridge, and we can see a long way. And, you know, I mean, it's nothing to talk about five miles because I can see for 80 miles. Yeah. So, <laughs> Um, so here he comes and I'm thinking, okay, I got to get, I got to get to a spot because the first thing I wanted to do when he come between us, I wanted to see how big this son of a gun is. Yeah. Now, um, we shoot lines across to the carrier and then they haul on those lines and then they haul on it. They get a bigger rope. And once they get the big rope, then they haul in the steel cable and they attach that. And then we slide uh, fuel probes down and stuff like that and also hook up uh, what they call high lines. And basically, on their end, it's a static line, a static steel cable. And then our line, our side, we, we raise it up and lower it, right? So it's at a high angle and then at a low angle. So what we actually do is attach cargo to that, and then we raise it up, and then it slides right over to them. It's a pretty unique operation. So we've got all that going on. We've got a couple other lines. Um, Right there, uh, beneath the bridge, there's a, a sound-powered cable f- uh, for the uh, for the bridge to talk directly to the carrier, and there's another one that actually connects. If I, and I'm trying to remember this, if I remember this right, there's another one that connects. I think all of our stations to their stations, and then there was another line <laughs> that uh, gauged uh, how far we were away from the carrier. We try. I think. Uh, most ships we get about 100 feet. Carrier seems like about 150, maybe 200 feet away from them. So I've got these lines for reference, and um, so the first one's like so it's like 10 feet, and then 10 feet, and then to the next to, to the first cargo line is I want to say 30 feet, and then past that is uh, I think it's 60 feet to the next. Um, I think it was close, maybe 50, 60 feet to the next uh, set of hoses. And um, so I'm thinking, okay, well, this looks like a good good way to measure this. And uh, boy, here he comes, just like he's meandering through the lazy river, right? Just <laughs> not a care in the world. And he, I mean, I'm looking down, and I, I remember, I can see it to this day. Um, he was, uh, and you can see him very clearly. And he was white. And, and um, I realized later that uh, aren't uh, great whites, they're black on top. Right. So I don't, like, I've never seen another one in the water, so I don't know looking down on him. But I just remember this one, it was all white. I never see a bit of black on him. Hmm. And he came down, and so I waited till his tail fin was even with the first line. And uh, I remember just quickly look into the other line and I'm, so I'm looking down on him and I'm probably one of the few people, uh, only people actually on the ship at the time that at least on my ship, I don't know about the carrier that had a really good view and I think could make that judgment. And my first estimate was 55 to 60 feet. Man. And I, I really couldn't believe it. I actually, I actually like, did a double take and I just checked it again. And then I thought, oh, my camera. And so I popped my camera up and uh, took a couple pictures real fast. Um, in case you're wondering, none of those pictures came out. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I know everybody's going, he's got pictures. Yeah. Uh, so, Craig, how high above him were you when you or like the lines that you use for reference? How high above him were they? Um, those lines actually were 30 feet above him. They're right on the main deck. And then I'm four decks above that. So we have to know that, I mean, or at least using those lines, he was the, the smallest he was, was 55 to 60 feet. Yes. Whereas if you would have dropped those lines well, I, closer in the water, you yeah, know, he might have actually hard. been bigger, right? He could have actually been bigger. Right. I, uh, I second guess myself. And then I, I had come up with this figure of uh, maybe maybe I was wrong. It was thirty maybe it's thirty five feet. But um I you know, I knew I knew that, that yeah, that's not right. 
that was I measured correctly. I went back and measured it. And I was like, that's 55, 60 feet. So this is something that kind of haunted you for a while, trying to figure out, did I really see what I thought I saw? Yeah. Um, I've thought about it for a very long time. Um, it wasn't until last year I was sitting around watching Discovery Channel with my son, and we saw the, the big Discovery Channel on the Megalodon. Right. And, uh-huh. and, uh, my son was obsessed with that. He was a Megalodon, you know. And, uh, of course, he's... You know, I knew watching the show. I was like, "This is this is a bunch of crap and yeah. stuff." And, um, <laughs> but you know, it intrigued me. I was like, well, "Wait a minute, what what did I see?" And so I've you know I've spent the last year just kind of really kind of looking at a little, little bit of research and stuff. And um, it, when I just look at the size of great whites that they come up with average, I'm thinking, "No, this thing this thing dwarfs that." Mm, man. It, it, Really, it's really rocked me. I mean, was there anybody else that saw it that was on the ship with you that y'all discussed afterwards? Um, <laughs> well, so during an underway replenishment, especially on, on my ship, uh, it's kind of what they call an all hands evolution. So um, every department uh, pitches in dudes to go in and uh, participate in the underway in the underway replenishment. We got teams of guys on each line and nose. We got uh, helo operations going. We're airlifting stuff to other ships, to the carrier. They're airlifting stuff to us. Um, you know, we got stuff on both sides. Um, I forget how many guys were on the crew. But I mean, and then plus, when we're doing uh, replenishment with the carrier, that's anywhere from anywhere from six to twelve hours. Huh. So it's not so, quick and easy. It's just you know, no, it's a full time job that you're you're on for a while. Right. We're on. Yeah, we're on for a while, and you know, those guys rotate and stuff like that. And so. Uh, when that shark came down, uh, every guy on the on the port side of us, and I know the aircraft carrier, everybody stopped. Wow! So they there's everybody got a good eyeful of what that thing was. Yes, yeah, a lot of people go. In fact, we had a guy that was getting ready to uh, cross with a uh, crossover under the aircraft carrier. <laughs> no thanks. Now you, yeah, well, yeah, we we actually you strap him in this metal chair. <laughs> That guy's a and sucker. They, Don't point at me, Kyle. Yeah. No. Hell no. <laughs> and they raised him up, right, mm-hmm. on the high line, and he, and they raised him all the way up, and they were getting ready to release him, and he starts yelling, no! <laughs> he sees that shark. That ship don't carry enough beer to talk me into going across there, man. It is not happening. I'm half freaked out so, just hearing it, man. Yeah, and uh, well, like I said, well, I've, seen some, I've seen some weird stuff at sea. Um, I've got another couple stories for you you might like, but... That is my first and only shark that even close to that big that I you know I've ever seen. And did it just did it just swim off? Yeah, and never dove or nothing. Just kept on going. Nope. <laughs> Wasn't he scared was of giant not, aircraft carriers or nothing. Nothing. He he was not intimidated. And I'm telling you that is some strange behavior. Man, I, I'm here to I'm here to tell you. We used to have dolphins play at our bow all the time, and when we were with an aircraft carrier, no, we wouldn't see them at all. Nothing came up. Nope. And then this thing just charts, just cruises through, <laughs> right? Uh. Yeah, just cruised on through. So I'm glad you guys like that. So I don't know. Did I see a megalodon? Was it just a big great white shark? I don't. I don't. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know that we will. <laughs> no, I mean, and it, and it could be. I mean, you know, people are always chasing Bigfoot and stuff here on the land. They're always saying, "Well, there's so much woods, man. You know how much ocean there is. There could very easily be a large uh, shark that size that's still alive. You know." Well, yeah, I saw it. So, yeah, um, I've tried telling people about it before, uh, like at the local zoo and stuff, and they just look at me like I'm crazy. I'm <laughs> like, no, no, you didn't, you didn't see anything that big. That's not possible. I'm like, huh. lady. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, we appreciate the story so much. Don't get off the phone. Uh, okay. Thank you once again for giving us that story, and thank you for your service. You're very welcome. Okay, folks, well, we were talking with Craig after that uh, amazing story, and he brought up another story that we had no clue about. And so he's going to tell us that one, too. So, Craig, let us let us hear it. Okay. Um, we were uh, in the Caribbean. <clears throat> um I don't exactly remember what we were doing. I've been down to the Caribbean so many times. It's not even funny. 
uh, especially down to Guantanamo and all that. Um, I have to say this was probably around, what, uh, 89. And um, my best friend was on lookout. And uh, you know what? No, no. This had to have been, this had to have been 91. It was after Desert, Desert Shield. Desert okay. One. And you were off the coast of Cuba? Um, no, we were actually, I think, south side of Puerto Rico. Okay. Pretty far from Puerto Rico, though. And um, the one thing, if you, you can encounter some pretty kind of strange climate stuff, in, in, you know, on the water. And the one thing, and I remember this this day, uh, you see some, you usually mostly see it at night, but you can see it at day too. And it's when the ocean gets so calm that it's literally like glass. I kid you not. Not a ripple. And the only thing cutting through the water is just our wake. That's it. On the sea. They, on the sea. Oh, that's it's strange. rare, but it does happen. And um, and I remember that this was one of the very few times that ever happened during the day. Most of the time, you see it during the night, and it's beautiful. You see the moon, and just like it always seems to be a full moon too. I have to think about that. So you know, I don't. Uh, the reason behind that is, but um, and my friend calls out and says, "Hey, you see that?" And I go, "What?" And so I look out and I see this bank of fog about 10 miles out. Now, this is very strange. In the middle of the ocean, you don't get fog. Mm -hmm. You get fog when you're around land. We were not anywhere near land. I mean, you can get fog pretty out, pretty far out, maybe, you know, 20, 30 miles out, you know, from land, maybe even a little further, but not, not hundreds of miles out in the ocean. And uh, I was like, well, that's, that's really odd. And he goes, no, wait. And just as soon as he said that, it, I, this sounds so cliche, and this was way before Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> Out of that fog came a ship. And it was a pretty darned old ship. Wasn't anything like 1700s or anything like that. It was a lot older. Um, so, you know, I, I told my friend there, I said, oh, okay, right here, get out of the way, get me get on the big eyes. So I looked on the big eyes and, uh, I don't really remember. I seen some detail. I couldn't place the ship. It was very odd. It had a, a large square sail, um, a little tapered on the ends and had a, uh, uh, smaller, um, uh, or, uh, a smaller sail uh, up forward, and then another looked like another small, um, how would you call it, like a like a mizzen sail. It actually kind of runs the length of the ship, but you know that direction, about forward to aft, not uh, port to starboard. So, and as soon as that ship came out, it turned and went back in. Now we're ten miles away. I couldn't see any crew. But that doesn't mean anything. It turned, went back into the fog, and the fog was gone in 60 seconds, and there was no ship to be seen. Wow, that's incredible. Now, I uh, have over the years, I did research um, on what I saw. And uh, looking at older ships, and I used to go to the library in the days before the Internet. And um, I remember I was at the my local library and I was looking through and I was looking for ancient ships, ancient ships. And then, you know, you kept getting a lot of uh, like Viking ships, stuff like that. And it was, none of that was that. What this ship was, was a really old Chinese vessel. And I will swear on that one. Man. The only thing I found that come close. That's incredible. That is oh, that's so wild. Years old. Man. Like a Chinese, yeah, like a Chinese vessel from around, I think, when I say 100 BC. Wow. That is, I love stories like that. Well, there's no explaining so, it. That's it. No. I mean, you saw it exactly. You got on the big binoculars and looked at it, saw the whole thing clear as day. Yes. And then was like, I don't know what the hell I'm looking at. And then it's gone. Poof. You're like, whoa. Yeah. The whole thing maybe, the whole thing maybe lasted three minutes. Wow. You got a little glimpse into like a, a time slip or a little 
I guess a little ghost ship, phantom something, something. that's awesome. That's yeah. right. I wonder if it was a time slip because it seemed like maybe they saw us and said, what the hell? Yeah, well, obviously turned. they turned, right. Yeah, man, that is that is interesting. So, I hope you guys, oh, I'm glad you guys enjoyed that story. But oh, it's greatness. And we're back. Very cool. I love it. I mean, what could he and all those other sailors seen if it wasn't a Megalodon? What the heck was it? Well, like I've always said about Craig telling his story is it's a matter of fact, and he's a trained observer. Right. It's not like you put me behind the binoculars, right, or this knucklehead beside me. This dude is trained. He is the man when it comes to doing this job. So it's not like, I mean, if you're going to put somebody like that in charge of all of these sailors, you're going to kind of and trust them with everybody's life. You're going to believe exactly what he saw. Yeah. It's yeah. just, it is what it is, right? And yeah, it, it it's out there. It's right? just out there. Very, very cool. Cam, what do you got planned for the rest of your week? I'm going to be hot again, still helping my son. I've been actually going out and working with my boy, and it has been a blast. We have had a great time. Aside from the heat, the other day we were doing a little electrical work, and it was 111. And that's Man. not a lot of fun right there. But it's just fun. I've really been enjoying getting to spend a lot more time with him. And it's like, hey, if that's the only way I can do it, then that's the way I'm going to do it. <laughs> that's right. Uh, don't forget about our live show coming up. Yep. In October, October 28th. 7 p.m. At the Panther Island Brewery in yeah. Fort Worth. We're going to be doing Expanded Perspectives live show. So if anybody's around and wants to come check that out, you need to hit us up. Let us know you're coming. Yeah, I'll, I need to, I'll build a thing so we can post it up on all of our all of our social media stuff. So let everybody know that's that's going to pop off with that whole deal. It'll be fun. Like I said, look, me and Kyle ain't charging anything for it. You want to come and hang out? They'll sell you wristbands. Y'all can drink good craft beer here in the great state of Texas. And we are going to talk about all kinds of fun stuff. And we've got a lot of friends that are going to be showing up. A lot of other people in the biz that are going to want to be there that you could talk to. Authors are going to be there to hang out and talk with us and all that. So it'll be a fun time, y'all. Um, we're going to have stickers and stuff like oh, that yeah. there too. Should so we go ahead and tell them? Yeah, go ahead. So we reached out and had an artist build us a custom uh, design, and we are going to be offering shirts. We are getting that set up so we can offer a limited run of this custom design shirt. So we'll get that so we can pop off, and I'll show you the – get ready to post the pictures. Yeah, of that, you should post yeah. – you should at least just post the picture on our Instagram so people can see the design. Yeah, I'll put get that Get it hyped up so we can yeah. get those pre-orders coming I'll in. I'll put that out there and all that stuff. And then we'll try to have some, you know, at the at the thing too. And we don't know. I mean, it'll be all kinds of stuff. But it'll be a good time for sure. Yeah. Uh, if you have any stories you'd like to share with me and Cam and the other listeners, don't forget you can email the show, expandedperspectives at yahoo.com, or you can call into the show, uh, 888-393-2783. Don't forget about our sponsors, Trade Coffee. Trade is offering new sponsors a total of $30 off your first order, plus free shipping when you go to drinktrade.com slash expanded. That's more than 40 cups of coffee for free. Get started by taking their quiz, drinktrade.com slash expanded. Let trade find you a coffee you'll love. That's drinktrade.com slash expanded for $30 off. And also, don't forget about microdose gummies. They are available nationwide. Just go to microdose.com and use the code EXPANDED to get free shipping and $30 off your first order. That's about all the time we have for this episode of Expanded Perspectives. Till next time, folks, I'm Kyle. He's Cam. Peace, y'all.